on World News Tonight. Java Quake Deadly earthquake rocks Indonesia. Has there been tsunami warnings issued? Find out tonight. Twitter take back. Elon Musk lets former US President Trump back on Twitter. But will he tweet again? This comes just as President Biden turns 80. Potential doom. UN warns Russia against playing with fires. Ukraine nuclear plants were shelled. And thief of fantasy. The season begins as football fans were welcomed with fireworks and dazzling displays. This is Other There in a World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Tonight we start off in Indonesia as a deadly earthquake struck the main Indonesian island of Java, leaving over 40 people dead and hundreds more injured. Officials warn of possible aftershocks and say the death toll may rise. The 56 magnitude quake struck Sianjur town in West Java at a shallow depth of 10 kilometers. The tremor could be felt in the capital Jakarta about 100 kilometers away, where people in tall buildings were evacuated. Dozens of buildings were damaged including an Islamic boarding school, a hospital and other public facilities. Officials have warned the death toll could rise and of possible aftershocks and have not issued any tsunami warning as of yet. Now, Joe Biden turned 80 on Sunday, making him the first octogenarian president in U.S. history. According to recent polls, some 86% of Americans said they believe there should be a cutoff of age 75 for serving as president. U.S. President Joe Biden is now the first ever octogenarian president. He turned 80 on Sunday. That, combined with his granddaughter's wedding the day before, might be cause for some extra cheer around the White House. But fast forward to the 2024 race for the keys to that house. Vote, vote, vote. And Americans are heading into uncharted political territory when it comes to the age of the person who occupies it. Some 86% of Americans said they believe there should be a cutoff age of 75 for serving as president. If you ask New Yorkers how old is too old, they'll offer some unfiltered opinions. It's a question that honestly irritates me. So for 80, I wish him happy birthday. Some people at 60 should go nowhere near political power. Biden is already the oldest person to serve as president. And if he were to win a second four-year term, he would be 86 when it ends. In a recent MSNBC interview, Biden said questions about his age were, quote, totally legitimate, but that it was his intention to seek another term in the country's top job. And when it comes to the world's oldest current serving leaders, he doesn't even rank in the top 10. That's led by the 89-year-old president of Cameroon, Paul Bia. And at least some voters say that an individual's judgment might be more important than the number of candles on their cake. After nearly two years, former U.S. President Trump is allowed to be back on Twitter. The decision was made by the company's new owner, Elon Musk, but it's unclear if Donald Trump would return to the platform that helped catapult him to the White House in 2016. At Real Donald Trump is back on Twitter. The platform's new owner, Elon Musk, announced late on Saturday he was lifting the ban on Trump's account, despite the former U.S. president snubbing it earlier in the day. I hear we're getting a big vote to also go back on Twitter. Uh, I, I don't see it because I don't see any reason for it. Trump's comments came as some 15 million Twitter users voted in a poll organized by Musk, with 51.8 percent voting in favor of reinstating his account. After the results were announced, Musk tweeted, the people have spoken. Twitter banned Trump in January 2021 for inciting violence following the U.S. Capitol attack. Trump then had his own Truth Social app developed and made that his main source of direct communication with his followers. Speaking via video link at a Republican Jewish coalition meeting earlier on Saturday, Trump said he believed his platform had better engagement than Twitter and would stick with it. They have a lot of problems at Twitter. You see what's going on. It may make it, it may not make it, but I, the problems are incredible. Uh, the engagements are negative. And you have a lot of bots and you have a lot of fake accounts, which I think they should get on. But Truth Social has taken the place for a lot of people, and I don't see them going back onto Twitter. Twitter did not respond to a request for comment. 
Musk had first said in May he planned to reverse the ban on Trump, but afterwards sought to ease advertisers' concerns by saying he would set up a content moderation council composed of people with widely diverse viewpoints. Musk said no account would be reinstated before the council convened and until there was a clear process for doing so. There has been no new information about the council or process. Musk on Saturday tweeted, New Twitter policy is freedom of speech but not freedom of reach, saying users would not find hate tweets unless they specifically seek them out. Still in the U.S. now, snowfall of more than six feet in western New York state prompted officials to restrict road travel and forced airlines to cancel flights in the Buffalo area ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday. The wintry scene in Hamburg, New York on Sunday could almost be idyllic. But with more than six feet of snow reported in parts of the region in a matter of days, people here know it will take a ton of work to dig out. Mike Miller was getting to it on Saturday. Despite staring down a snow pile nearly as tall as him, he said he's seen worse. I've been through several, and I would say this is probably the third most amount of snow I've seen. Squalls began blowing in from Lake Erie and Lake Ontario on Thursday. The state's second largest city of Buffalo more than doubled its previous one-day snowfall record on Saturday with more than 16 inches, according to the National Weather Service. There have been flight cancellations and road closures. Even kids were having a hard time finding a silver lining. About 150 National Guard members have been deployed to help with snow removal. New York Governor Kathy Hochul said on Saturday. She said a request for a federal emergency declaration is also in the works. So far, at least two people have died of apparent heart attacks while shoveling. And the snow may not let up just yet. According to the National Weather Service, conditions could persist through Monday morning. After years of resistance from rich governments, nations for the first time agreed to set up a fund to provide payouts to developing countries that suffer loss and damage from climate-driven storms, floods, droughts and wildfires. Countries finally came to an agreement at the COP27 climate summit early on Sunday. It sets up a loss and damage fund to help poor countries being battered by climate disasters, but does not boost efforts to tackle the emissions causing them. After tense negotiations that ran through the night, the Egyptian COP27 presidency released the final text for a deal and called a plenary session to quickly push it through. Negotiators made no objections as COP27's president, Samir Shukri, rattled through the final agenda items in the Egyptian resort of Sharm el-Sheikh. I now invite the COP to adopt the decision entitled Funding Arrangements for Responding to Loss and Damage Associated with the Adverse Effects of Climate Change. The swift approval for creating a dedicated loss and damage fund still left many of the most controversial decisions on the fund until next year, including who should pay into it. Delegates praised the breakthrough on setting up the fund as climate justice for its aim in helping vulnerable countries cope with storms, floods and other disasters being fueled by rich nations' historic carbon emissions. But some felt the deal did not go far enough, including EU climate policy chief Franz Timmermans. This is the make or break decade. But what we have in front of us is not enough of a step forward for people and planet. It does not bring enough added efforts from major emitters to increase and accelerate their emissions cuts. It does not bring a higher degree of confidence that we will achieve the commitments made under the Paris Agreement and in Glasgow last year. It does not address the yawning gap between climate science and our climate policies. COP26 President Alok Sharma was also critical of the final text in his closing comments. Emissions peaking before 2025, as the science tells us, is necessary. Not in this text. Clear follow-through on the phase-down of coal. Not in this text. A clear commitment to phase out all fossil fuels. Not in this text. And the energy text weakened in the final minutes. Friends, I said in Glasgow that the pulse of 1.5 degrees was weak. Unfortunately, it remains on life support. Small island nations facing a climate-driven rise in sea level had pushed for the loss and damage deal, but lamented a lack of ambition on curbing emissions. 
The two-week summit, billed as the African COP, has been seen as a test of global resolve to fight climate change, even as a war in Europe, energy market turmoil and rampant consumer inflation distract international attention. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. The head of the UN nuclear watchdog has warned that whoever fired artillery at Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is playing with fire as his team prepared to inspect it for damage from the weekend strikes. Ukraine's nuclear power plant, the largest in Europe, has once again come under attack, prompting the UN to warn of a potential nuclear disaster. The Zaporizhia plant in southern Ukraine is under Russian control. It was rocked by more than a dozen blasts on Saturday evening and Sunday, according to the International Atomic Energy Agency. The head of the UN watchdog, Rafael Grossi, said the explosions were extremely disturbing and whoever was doing it was, quote, playing with fire. Both Russia and Ukraine have blamed each other for the attacks. This is Russia's defence ministry spokesman, who accuses Kyiv of firing shells at power lines supplying the plant. The Ukrainian nuclear energy firm Energotom accused Russia of targeting infrastructure in an attempt to further limit Ukraine's power supply. The IAEA team on the ground said there had been damage to some building systems and equipment, but none of them critical for nuclear safety and security so far. Repeated shelling of the plant has raised concern about the potential for a grave accident just 300 miles from the site of the 1986 Chernobyl disaster. Elsewhere in southern Ukraine, hundreds of people in the city of Herzon flocked to buy groceries on Sunday at the first Ukrainian supermarket to open since the city was retaken by Ukrainian forces over a week ago. During the near nine months of occupation, the Russian-installed government had brought in Russian source goods and even introduced the ruble as currency. As the Russian forces now retreat, they're moving to reinforced positions in the eastern Donetsk and Luhansk where Ukraine's president said on Sunday there had been fierce fighting and artillery fire. The Biden administration ruled that Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has immunity from a lawsuit over the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, drawing immediate condemnation from the slain journalist's former fiancé. Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman arrived at a summit of world leaders in Thailand on Friday. His first-class welcome underscoring his comfort among his peers, despite his alleged involvement in the brutal killing of a U.S.-based Saudi journalist. Any lingering worry he might have felt likely lifted after the White House said the prince, known as MBS, had immunity in a civil lawsuit filed by the former fiancé of Jamal Khashoggi, who was murdered and dismembered inside the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in 2018. The decision by the Biden administration granting MBS immunity drew immediate condemnation from Khashoggi's former fiancé, Hatice Chenges, who tweeted, quote, We thought maybe there would be a light to justice from USA, but again, money came first. The Washington Post journalist had criticized the Crown Prince's policies. He was killed by Saudi government agents, an operation U.S. intelligence believed was ordered by MBS, the de facto ruler of the kingdom. Riyadh said the operation was conducted by rogue elements and that MBS was not involved. A spokesperson for the White House National Security Council said in a written statement, the immunity decision was a, quote, legal determination made by the State Department under longstanding and well-established principles of customary international law. Justice Department lawyers said the executive branch of U.S. government, referring to the Biden administration, had determined that as a head of state of a foreign government, Bin Salman has immunity from U.S. courts. The Saudi government communications office did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Following North Korea's firing of an intercontinental ballistic missile, the United Nations are set to hold a Security Council meeting. And ahead of that meeting, the UN Secretary General faced criticism for the North's foreign minister who called out the UN chief for lacking objectivity. Following the United Nations Secretary General's condemnation of North Korea's firing of an intercontinental ballistic missile last Friday, the regime's foreign minister has hit back. 
In a statement carried by the state-run Korean Central News Agency on Monday, Choi son hee expressed deep regret over UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres siding with the United States and failure to be impartial and objective. Che said that the Secretary General calling Pyongyang's legitimate self-defense against Washington a provocation made her think of him as a member of the White House or its State Department. This comes after Guterres strongly condemned the North's most recent ICBM launch and urged the regime to immediately stop further provocations. But Che's statement could also be interpreted as a show of discontent against the United Nations Security Council meeting on Monday. The meeting requested by the U.S. is set to discuss North Korea following its series of missile launches this year. And the international community is seemingly holding high hopes that the meeting will be fruitful. For one, G7 foreign ministers have already stressed that the UNSC should take significant measures against Pyongyang's provocative actions through a joint statement on Sunday. They also urged all states to fully and effectively implement all UNSC measures and sanctions against the North. Meanwhile, Ankara has launched a series of attacks against Kurdish targets in the north of Syria over the weekend in retaliation for a terrorist attack in Istanbul last week. And now hundreds of people took to the streets of Hamburg and Limassol calling for an immediate halt to the airstrikes. Kurdish communities in several European countries have held protests against Turkey's airstrikes in the northern regions of Syria and Iraq. In the German city of Hamburg, several hundred stepped out and slammed Ankara for civilian deaths. Kurds living in Cyprus also held a demonstration in Limassol, demanding for an immediate halt to the airstrikes. While some held placards, others called for freedom in Kurdistan. Turkey has launched the deadly strikes in its claw sword operation, targeting the Kurdish PKK group which Ankara holds responsible for last week's bomb attack in Istanbul. Its military says it struck 89 targets over the weekend, which included bunkers, ammunition depots and what it described as training camps belonging to terrorists. Kurdish-led forces in Syria have vowed to retaliate after claiming two densely populated villages were hit. On Sunday, a rocket fired from Syria reportedly injured three people on the border with Turkey. The blasts come a week after one of Istanbul's busiest streets was targeted, an attack which killed six people and injured more than 80. Turkish police have arrested dozens in connection with the strike, while five people have also been charged in Bulgaria. Malaysia's stock market and currency dipped after national elections produced the Southeast Asian nation's first hung parliament, setting off a scramble to confirm a coalition. Malaysia's political leaders scrambled on Sunday to secure support from rivals a day after a general election produced a hung parliament, with no coalition winning a parliamentary majority. Long-time opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim and former Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin each said they could form a government with support from other parties whom they did not identify. Anwar's Pakatan Harapan coalition won 82 lower house seats, short of the 112 majority, but slightly ahead of Muhyiddin Yassin's Parikatan National Coalition with 73. While Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaqub's Barisan National Alliance, whose United Malays National Organization had long been Malaysia's dominant political force, suffered its worst electoral defeat ever, winning just 30 of the 178 seats it vied for. Political analyst Azrul Hadi Abdullah Sani said the election showed that the country is more divided than expected. I think uh, rural Malays have rejected corruption, uh, looking for more cleaner and stable government. And with Prakita National making uh, inroads in Amno Vote Bank, um, it shows that is, there are three legitimate coalitions in the future of Malaysian politics. Forming a government may require the involvement of Malaysia's king, whose largely ceremonial role includes the power to appoint as prime minister a lawmaker he believes will command a majority when no coalition can do so on its own. The palace has now called each political party to present the name of a lawmaker it thinks has the majority support by 2 p.m. local time on Monday. A record number of Malaysians voted, with many like Daniel, 
hoping to end a spell of political uncertainty which has had three prime ministers in as many years. Just, uh, yeah, just, just disappointed in general because uh, I don't think the country is moving well. It's a fair representation of democracy in this country, but I, I, it's not a result I was hoping for. Without a clear winner, the uncertainty could persist as Malaysia faces slowing economic growth and rising inflation. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Four-time F1 world champion Sebastian Vettel scored the final point in 10th in the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix on what has been an emotional swan song weekend for the Aston Martin driver. He signed off a 15-year-old career with some tyre-smoking donuts on the start-finish straight. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said that her government would draft legislation for Parliament to discuss reducing the voting age to 16 after the country's highest court ruled that the current age limit was discriminatory. Clashes between police and anti-government protesters broke out in Lima as hundreds of people took to the streets, demanding the resignation of embattled President Pedro Castillo. Novak Djokovic beat Norway's Casper Rudd to collect a record equaling six ATP Finals title, earning the biggest paycheck ever in tennis for completing the season-ending tournament unbeaten. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with visuals of the opening ceremony of the 2022 Soccer World Cup held in Doha, Qatar. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.